Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners. And since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you wanna put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today, we have Alex Perney. He is a business development specialist and host of Advanta IRA's podcast, The uh, Alternative Investment Advantage. For more than a decade, Alex has helped thousands of clients invest in alternative assets by using self-directed retirement accounts. So thanks so much for being on the show today, Alex. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on here. It's uh, <clears throat> it's always fun to uh, get out there and kind of help educate people on a lot of the other options that they have when it comes to retirement finance, since most people are just kind of under the assumption if it's not on the stock market, well, it's not mm -hmm. really available. And, uh, you know, we've been, <clears throat> this is our 20th year in business over at Advanta mm -hmm. IRA, trying to uh, fix that uh, misconception. So thanks for having me on today. Yeah, no problem. I think uh, the last person we had about self-directed IRAs was uh, Scott Maurer, which is uh, one of your... Um... I guess you would say associates over there at Advanta. And that was years back. So it's great to get a refresher for the listeners here about what they can do with retirement funds other than investing them in traditional assets. So uh, before we get started, Alex, can you give us a little background about yourself, both uh, personally and professionally, prior to getting involved with self-directed uh, retirement accounts? Sure. I'm one of the uh, kind of few people out there that uh, have pretty much cut my uh, entire professional career in this industry. I oh. uh, graduated with my degree in business administration from Eckerd College down here in sunny St. Pete, Florida. Uh, unfortunately, I graduated right in one of the worst times to get a job, which was the tail end of 2011-2012. Uh, so, um, you know, after college, it was, you know, basically just trying to find something to literally put a roof over my head. And I managed to get a job uh, in our mailroom here back in quite literally our mailroom. I was opening mail uh, uh, for people back in uh, 2012 and uh, just kind of uh, took a liking to it and it kind of fit my skill set of, you know, not liking to just look at a stock ticker all day. I know I wanted to go into finance, but uh, that's kind of how I got my foot in the door. And then uh, from there, you know, I, you know, I, I started my kind of investing career with clients trying to to pull all the REO roles off of all the foreclosed properties from the Great Recession. So it was a lot of negotiating with big banks, which caused me to uh, have a rather jaded view of uh, the general financial system in the United States, especially when it comes to uh, what a lot of those financial institutions were doing with uh, zombie properties and properties that uh, my clients and investors were actively trying to pull off their roles to get them out there, get them rented, get them rehab, get the, you know, get you know, get this stuff back out on the market. So I uh, yeah, that's kind of where it, where it started. And then it just progressed from there. I believe before I moved out of operations, I uh, handled something like almost $300 million worth of client capital and over 1200 or 1300 um, you know, individual closings, investments, and things like that for clients. So that um, you know, was the first half of my career. And then I moved into uh, business development and um, haven't looked back since. So that's kind of Alex Perney in a nutshell for my uh, professional uh, career out of, uh, out of college into this. Awesome. So it, it's very interesting because, I mean, what's changed when you're talking about 2011, we got out of school there. And um, today it's it's amazing how, I mean, the whole market has has changed. I mean, it's just back then it was just so crazy. I was talking to someone else about this uh, a few days ago and it was just, it was blood in the streets kind of a thing and uh, didn't really turn around until after, you know, uh, 2011 kind of thing where it started. It's really trajectory uh, to where we are now, but pretty amazing. I don't think anybody knew it was going to go this long or this, this high. So. 
Yeah, and it's and it's been really interesting to watch. I know you de- definitely uh, deal more in the uh, the commercial and the multifamily side, and even those kind of deals have changed. But one of the more interesting things, at least from my perspective, is really how deals have changed. You know, real estate. You know, hey, I have money, I have something I want to sell and buy. You know, that kind of general economic driver hasn't changed. But the different creative ways that people have put deals together, whether it's in the single family side, seeing it go from you know low ball cash offers to to, you know, market values increasing and people getting more creative with debt structures and, you know, stepping into a lending role and then things like equity participation and all sorts of different caveats to how real estate has evolved over the past decade. I have been fascinating to watch and it's been really cool to be a part of that too. So yeah, that, uh, that blood in the water mentality really hasn't gone away over the past 10 years, unfortunately, no matter whether it was, you know, the tail end of the Great Recession with just properties being, you know, inventories being crazy. And then, you know, we have a little bit of a spike and a drop. And then we have to what we are now where it's, you know, it's a huge seller's market now to a buyer's market. It's, you know, it's been, been fun to ride that ride that wave. But it's been the probably one of the cooler things I've seen is just how creative people have gotten with putting together these deals. And, you know, basically, you know, you, you take some dips, but it's kind of been a 45 degree angle on that on that graph of prices and demand uh, for the past 10 years of real estate. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, Alex, for people that might not know or be well versed in the uh, self-directed retirement space, can you give us an overview of what a self-directed retirement account is and the types of accounts, uh, you know, business and professional accounts that are available? Yeah, and it's interesting. You sent me over the kind of the question sheet earlier of some things you were going to pose to me, and and I found it kind of fitting that uh, an individual called me this morning, and it's and they were asking me the question of, well, you know, on this paperwork it doesn't say self directed IRA on here. What's what's the deal with that? I thought it was something a self directed IRA, and it's always kind of a fun thing to explain to people what this is. Um, and it's kind of maybe counterintuitive to what most companies or people in my profession would tell you is that. There is no such thing as a self-directed IRA. When you look up the IRS code, you're not going to find something that says, hey, here's a self-directed IRA. Self-direction is a, a marketing term and a philosophy basically aligned with what you're actually investing in. You are going out and picking your own investments that are in the scope of self-directed IRAs out of, that are outside the stock market. So things like real estate, private equities, limited partnerships, uh, private loans startup companies, trusts, LLCs, anything that's not on a traded securities market is what you can pursue with a self-directed IRA. And that can be a traditional IRA. So your pre-tax from your old 401k, it can be after tax, it can be a Roth IRA. You can even self-direct stuff like health savings accounts and education savings accounts. Uh, and I personally self-direct my own HSA. And not to get too far into the weeds, but there's so many cool opportunities with different tax qualified plans that you can actually self-direct and buy alternative assets with that are just not a traditional or Roth IRA. So that's a big part of you know what we try to do is you know bring that education to say, hey, you know, you're not locked in to just buying, you know, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, or IBM. You're not just saying, okay, great. Well, I want to not pick individual stocks. I want a mutual fund or I want a hedge fund. I want an index fund. Those are good options for people out there, but if you want true diversity and you want to buy tangible assets, you need a custodian that's willing to hold that and you need a self-directed IRA. Yeah. So what type of assets can someone purchase or invest into, let's say, uh, with a self-directed account or a account where they're making their decisions on what assets is going into? Yeah, so it's it's a question best answered, I really feel like, in telling people what they can't buy uh, because the you know, the list kind of goes on in perpetuity. I've had clients put together things where a client had a secured commercial note against the breeding rights to a bull in their IRA. I've had people that have bought burial crypts in highly desirable cemeteries in their IRAs. And I've had people that bought rental properties. So instead of kind of going through the list and saying, hey, here's X, Y, Z, because we have 30 minutes and I couldn't scratch the surface. Basically, here's what you can't buy with a with an IRA of any kind. It's just the IRS does say what you cannot purchase. You can't buy a life insurance policy directly with the IRA. Kind of creates a you know a feedback loop of tax exemption because they paid out tax free anyway. So the IRA can't hold a life insurance policy, and it can't buy collectibles. It can buy certain types of coins like gold bullion things like that, but you can't buy a rare bottle of wine. You can't buy baseball cards, Pokemon cards. You can't buy anything that derives its value from collectability. And of course, there's people that are going to say, oh, well, you know, there is value. There's markets for this stuff. I don't make the rules. 
we just put them out there. So collectibles and life insurance. And you also can't buy or sell anything to a disqualified individual, meaning you can't buy or sell anything to yourself or your mother, father, son, daughter, or spouse. Mm-hmm. Anything else, and when I say anything, I've had clients that have, again, gotten extremely creative with that, uh, typically works. Um, you know, if, if you feel like you can make money with something and you feel like it's a good avenue for you to pursue that investment, go for it. But again, a lot of what we deal with uh, in our AUM portfolio is clients buying real estate or real estate adjacent. Um, so, you know, direct equity, debt debt type instruments, trust LLCs, limited partnerships. Uh, that's kind of the lion's share of what people do. But again, if you feel like you can make money on it, go for it. Yeah. No, it's pretty great. It's 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 a very interesting. I have a self-directed IRA I've had for years and I typically invested into, I don't have any real estate in it actually. It's all in, um, I do a lot of angel investing in venture capital in it, which is not very tax efficient investing. <laughs> so it makes it very, it makes it fantastic. I invest in real estate all outside of my IRA, but it, it's an, I mean, it's, it's pretty powerful. I mean, you can, you know, there's lots of stories. Other people that really harness the power of investing into assets that they probably know better than, um, you know, like you said before, major blue ship companies that they don't, you know, it's just there and, they're not going to have the upward mobility or the gains that you might get from something else that you know really well. So, yeah. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I try to make sure people understand it's that, you know, there's nothing wrong with the stock market. People do incredibly well by letting other people kind of invest their money. But if you were to sit down the average person, and I consider myself, you know, working in finance for over a decade, I'm, you know, by no means do I know everything, but Maybe I'm, you know, smarter than the average bear occasionally when it comes to this stuff. I don't know my know my head from the hole in the ground when it comes to understanding the stock market. It's and anyone that tells you that do that does is lying. Um, you know, because it's just almost it's one of those things where it's complicated to a fault. And again, it has a use case out there for a lot of people. And as far as diversity goes, certainly is probably a huge part of your portfolio. But how many people do you know? that are consummate stock experts, but how many people do you know are pretty good at real estate or are, you know, understand these kind of things that are much more tangible to a higher degree that can probably make more money utilizing it. I'd say the latter is probably true. Yeah. No, I, t- I totally agree with that. So as a, as we're talking here mainly about real estate, um, you know, many of your listeners to the show will most likely be interested in investing in real estate. And there's one part that I think trips up some real estate investors when it's coming to self-directed IRAs and accounts, and it's the uh, UBIT tax. And it's, mm-hmm. um, as I understand it, it's the only income tax that you need to pay when investing in real estate. But can you explain more of what the UBIT tax is and when it is, um, you know, when it comes into play for investors? Yeah, absolutely. So it's <laughs> you asked me a question that uh, I I am really pretty passionate about. I kind of am the person that tends to get a lot of these questions, and I'm actually doing a webinar in a few weeks um, directly on this kind of stuff. Anyway, it's um, it's it's interesting stuff. So UBIT tax. We kind of need to break this down into two parts. So UBIT stands for unrelated business income tax. And there's a subset of it called unrelated debt finance income tax. Now, they're both basically kind of the same as far as the calculation goes, but UBIT really refers to, let's say, a tax-exempt entity. In this case, we're talking about IRAs, owns an active trader business. So your IRA goes and it operates a laundromat is the example I like to use. Well, if the IRA owned it, it would never be paying any taxes. So the IRS comes in and says, hey, we got to level the playing field. We're going to subject this business income to tax. Now, more specific to real estate investors is that if they invest into a project that has debt, that's more of the trigger for what a lot of people run into. Because what is real estate if not expensive? Most of the time, people are going to have to borrow money or there's going to be some type of debt that's going to work in there to allow for the project to come to fruition. Now, easy example, your IRA has 100 grand in it, it wants to buy a $200,000 property. So it needs to finance the other 100 grand. Well, in that case, and not to get too far into the minutia of you know, qualifying IRA loans, what lenders like to look for, what kind of points and expenses go into that, let's just say that's the example you're going to use. 
So it's 50-50 debt leverage. Your loan to value is 50-50, 100 grand down, 100,000 financed. Now let's say in this is same example that it has $2,000 a month in rent. And let's say you live in Narnia and there's no taxes, there's no insurance, there's no expenses. And at the end of the year, you have $24,000 coming back into your IRA. And again, for argument's sake, let's say it's interest only. So you have no change to your debt ratio. At the end of the year, $12,000 of that is going to be subjected to UBIT or more specifically UDFI. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's taxed at trust rates, which can be kind of onerous, but the benefit of that is that the IRS for this gives you a $1,000 deduction. You get to take depreciation, amortization. You get to write off everything with regard to the property to help narrow that down even further just like y'all do in commercial real estate with things like cost seg and accelerated depreciation, you get to take advantage of those tax tools. So hopefully at the end of the day, the IRA has a negligible or net zero tax liability. But that's where it mostly fits in, is that if your IRA is going to be invested in something with debt, then UDFI is going to apply. If it buys an active trader business, UBIT's going to apply. Now, one last thing I'll say on that before I can lose myself completely in getting into the nuts and bolts of it, is that a lot of times when people buy real estate, they buy it through things like LLCs. Well, LLC is a kind of a business, limited liability corporation. People think, oh, my IRA buys into an LLC, I'm automatically going to have UBIT, even if the property's bought cash. Well, again, there is a spectrum of this whole thing. But if you're in a passive position and it's not an active trader business, it's being taxed as a pass-through and there's no debt or anything. So just an IRA, being a member in a private LLC, there's no debt. You, UBIT's not going to really apply in that scenario. But again, I always recommend people talk to a tax advisor. Problem is, is that this is really boutique stuff. There's not a, even, even a consummate tax professional might not be too familiar with this. But if you need further assistance, I recommend... Uh, talking to a tax professional that deals in the nonprofit sector, because this is the same type of tax return that nonprofits have to file when you have income outside the scope of the nonprofit. So like, you know, nonprofit goes out and does something that's not under their tax exempt nature, they have to file the same tax return. So those are the people you need to talk to. But again, if you avoid debt with your IRA investment, and also if you're not act investing in an active trader business, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, so that's kind of UBIT and UDFI in a nutshell. And one thing I'll leave you with is that, again, debt being so synonymous with real estate, hard to get away from it, real estate is expensive. If you are someone that has, let's say, a self-employed business, or you have an LLC that maybe you run your personal rentals through, you can establish what's called a solo 401k for that self-employed business. And a really cool part about solo 401ks is that they are across the board exempt from the UDFI, that part of UBIT for debt in real estate. So if you can use a solo 401k to buy real estate that has debt associated with it, whether that's a limited partner in a commercial real estate venture, or if you're buying properties and just leveraging them and you know rinse wash repeat you know money down debt finance don't have to worry don't have to file that tax return at all they are automatically exempt from acquisition debt taxes on newly acquired real estate so again that's a lot to take in but if you have a personally owned business or you're self employed you almost don't even have to worry about it because you can just run it through a solo 401k very interesting yeah i've heard about the solo 401ks and people like you know, selling those type of uh, self-directed plans. I never knew, I never knew that it was except like that. So that's very interesting. Um, yeah. Alex, so say someone wants to get started with this and say someone has a Roth IRA or traditional IRA at uh, one of the large brokerages. And, um, you know, what is the process for getting set up and, you know, how difficult it is for just, let's say, opening and funding a self-directed retirement account? It's about as easy as anything else you do when it comes to banking, which maybe isn't the greatest example to use right now. But um, I mean, it's just a little bit of paperwork. You complete an application um, with IRAs. We submit a request to the other custodian. It gets wired over directly to us. There's no taxes. There's no penalties associated with it. Um, you know, just like if you were going to go from a large wirehouse, let's say if you were going to move your accounts from Vanguard to Fidelity, almost exactly the same process. No taxes, no reporting. You're just changing the custodian of who holds those funds. Um, so again, it's pretty easy. 401k rollover. So if you have an old employer's plan and you want to move it to an IRA, just a little bit of a longer process, but again, not too bad. 401k administrator sends it directly to us. Uh, and then once you're funded, then you're ready to go. You let us know exactly what you want to do. We help you with the process, you know, making sure paperwork, 
documents, everything signed, you know, dotted, done correctly to the letter of the IRS law. You know, that's what we take care of on the back end for you. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I when I've done it before, it, some of them, I know my brother has a regular Roth IRA somewhere and it takes literally like six weeks or eight weeks to get funds over. And for the one I have, it literally takes like eight days. So it just start the process sooner than later if you do want to get involved with this. And the other thing too, as I found out is, um, you know, when you're in there and it tells you how much is left for your contribution for the year, let's say into a Roth or something like that, you have to be very careful because if you're putting more money in, you can't, you know, double dip there and have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's always important to, yeah. you know, keep track of that stuff. And unfortunately with, or I should say, there is some fortunate and unfortunate things is that, you know, we, we so oftentimes, you know, retirement's far away from a lot of us. And a lot of the things that change have a lot of impact on us just aren't things that you kind of run into on a day-to-day -day basis. We just had a big tax law update with what they called the Secure Act 2.0 that changed, kind of turned the industry on its head, but, you know, not too many people outside of financial professionals like myself are kind of aware like that. But we just had essentially two new different types of Roth accounts created at the first of the year that, you know, people certainly aren't taking advantage of. And the IRS also hasn't exactly told us how to administer either. So they created something and uh, we're just kind of sitting here going, okay, what yeah. do we do now? <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Sam. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, just stuff to keep track of. Um, it's not too terribly difficult, but, you know, running in and just, you know, giving us a call and say, hey, what do we do? Help you out, no problem. Yeah, Alex. So one last thing about uh, the, the administrative part of it. Um, you know, we talked about the opening and funding of it. The I deal with this a lot as a syndicator. Our group does for bringing people into our deals with self-directed retirement accounts, and um, it's uh, normally you know it's it's always a few more steps than just you know doing a your private place memorandum, signing it, sending over. Can you give us an idea of what you so? If I'm you know, want to invest into a syndication, let's say a real estate syndication, what is what do I have to do? Like, what do I have to provide yeah. to you? How does the process work? Because I think people would be very interested in this as well. Yeah, absolutely. the The one piece of advice that I'll give everyone is when you're doing this, you're never going to annoy us by calling us. I'd much rather have someone that asks what they perceive to be too many questions and stuff gets done and there's no surprises. But at the end of the day, you know. Being, being a, you know, you're going to be more involved in self-direction. It's not, you know, a managed brokerage account. You are directing us as to what you do. So understanding there's some back and forth is important, but start to finish, it's not too terribly complicated. For your example, someone syndicating something, uh, you know, a limited partnership agreement, uh, you know, subscribing to private shares of, a, of an equity offering. Here's how it basically works. John Smith or Jane Smith completes our account application. We submit the paperwork to their other custodian, funds are in transit. That takes about five to 10 business days, depending wildly on who your other custodian is. Um, you know, if you're the quick ones could be five days for us to get a wire, the long ones it could be almost, you know, three to four weeks. It just really depends on who the other, other parties involved in. But let's say the account's open and, you know, over here at Harvard Site Capital, they say, hey, we have a deal coming up. Okay, great. Um, we'd always ask that the client put us in touch with their syndicator. So, it, you know, unless you came in and we've already been copied on emails, assume that we don't know who we need to talk to. So, so, hey, you know, here's Charles, talk to him. He's the one handling the sub docs. Great. At that point, we kind of take over. We say, okay, great, Charles, let's get a copy of that PPM. Let's get a copy of the subscription agreement. Anything that needs to be signed by the investor, we like to get first because we like to go through and put everything the IRA that needs to be specific to the IRA on there. So the tax ID number for the IRA, the name of the investor is the IRA, checking the right boxes to make sure that, you know, under the, you know, qualifications that's saying, hey, instead of this being personally, it's a retirement plan. Or, you know, again, there's kind of a, a few different places on these things and the standardized doc set that needs to be specific to the IRA. We prefer to do that instead of the client because we can get it right on the first shot. Once we get all that done, Long story short, we take care of the sub docs for the client, send it to them through DocuSign, go through it, make sure everything looks good to you, that we didn't you know, misspell your name or anything else like that. No. You approve it, we sign it, fund the investment per the wire instructions provided. So it's really not too terribly complicated. We take care of the small fine tooth details on the documents. And it's basically just kind of watching your email, reviewing some stuff, approving it, and then we push the funds back out once they arrive.
Yeah. It, it's not a difficult process, let's just say, but it can be time consuming because you're working with many different parties. So what I'm saying to someone that wants to or has one of these accounts that wants to invest into some sort of private placement uh, investment is that you have to start it as soon as possible. And then yeah. also keep um, you know, your your the self-directed custodian up the date of what you're doing. And then you also keep the syndicator or the group that you're investing with up to date on what you're doing. Um, yeah. Because then everybody knows what's happening and they know, okay, this is a self-directed thing. This is not going to be something that's done in 24 hours. This is might be done in two or three weeks, depending on the time frame of what we're doing. And keeping everybody on the same page will make sure that you keep your, your spot with the syndicator and everything's fine there. And then also they're not waiting for anything, you know, over at, uh, you know, Alex's office like that. Yeah, I always encourage people when you're doing this, you know, well, I should say to, to preface what I'm saying, rarely do people get mad when expectations are set correctly. You know, if the syndicator knows, you know, hey, this is going to take two weeks, great. If the client is under the impression that's saying, hey, okay, I understand this is going to take X long. It's when people have an expectation and it's not met as to when friction starts to come into the to everything, sand gets in the gears, if you will. So what I'd like clients to know, especially if you haven't done this before, it's probably going to take longer than you think. And that's not anything necessarily to do with, you know, us just wanting to be slow, but it's just kind of nature of the process. We have to send a request to your other custodian. I can't control how long Vanguard takes to send us the funds. We send them the request. They're a multinational corporation that's monitoring fax lines. And it just takes some time for yeah. that, to, that to occur. Um, but, you know, once things are here, we can potentially get stuff done within 48 hours of receipt. But again, to your point, the part that I see people get in the most, uh, have the most issue with, like the kind of recurring theme, the movie that keeps playing for people having issues is not starting that process early enough. Yeah. I'll get a call from someone saying, hey, I have this syndicator that is closing on, you know, due diligence is done. It's day 55 and we need to close Friday. And I'm like, <laughs> we need to do something and we, we need to do have done this a week ago. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, start the process early and things will run infinitely smoother. And that's pretty much true with life in general. Um, you yeah. know, it's just, just carry that over to your retirement plans and, and you'll be fine. Yeah. No, no, great information. So Alex, as we wrap up here, I just had one, uh, one question here. I'd like to talk to people that are involved with um, all different types of investments and uh, since we specifically talk about real estate on this uh, on the show, what what kind of uh, let's just say other than people not having a self directed retirement account, what are common mistakes maybe you see real estate investors make or investors make when investing in real estate, or you've seen maybe I imagine you've seen deals go south. I imagine you heard about that or anything like that. Well, is there any kind of common reoccurring theme that you've seen with that? Uh yeah. One thing that I'll say is. To at least real estate, where I've seen people have more issues, I see much people people having far less issues when they invest for cash flow than when they invest for appreciation. You never know what the market is going to do, but the people that you know are investing for cash flow are the ones I hear complain less. <laughs> you know, I can't speak to you know my clients, uh, you know, particular um, you know investment results, but what I will say is the clients that invest for cash flow, you know, tend to. Um, you know, have have less complaints. So they make as much money as the people that try to bet on appreciation. Certainly not. Um, you know, two thousand dollars a month is not going to get you nearly as fast as a hundred thousand dollars in a quarter. Basic math. But what I'd say is that that's kind of you know what I've seen over the past decade is is people being a little bit happier. Um, and then also, you know, making sure you understand the scope of what you're investing in. That's a big one. Is that. If you're going to go in and all you've been doing is relatively turnkey long-term rentals and you want to do a rehab, not doing your research or not having someone walk you through that first deal, that can help you out. I saw one of the, the worst ones I saw was a client that uh, thought they were buying, and any real estate investor is going to cringe, is they were buying something that had foundation issues. Um, Central in the state of Florida, limestone, we get settlements, we get sinkholes. They thought they um, had done their research turned out it was uh, a tune of maybe falling short about $50,000 on a deal for a single family. And um, it was a huge mess. So, you know, if you're going to change your trajectory and what you're doing with real estate and or investing, making sure you have a mentor to kind of guide you through that first deal um, would be great. So, you know, again, cash flow typically, at least in my experience, I've seen people do pretty well with and be pretty happy um, over the long term. And also, if you're going to change your 
trajectory or change what you're doing, make sure you have someone that has been there before to walk you through those first few deals. And, you know, I think that would probably be a, a pretty, pretty sound way to go through investing in life in general, probably. Yeah. The, uh, the cash flow is uh, great because if people are getting money out of a deal, um, and you reading online, um, you know, everything's going to hell or something like this in the markets and everything. People, you know, people are much more calm if they're like, oh, I'm still getting paid from, you know, on so-and-so property, something like this. And they're actually getting money out of the property where someone that might be investing where it goes three, four years without any money back. Um, it's a whole different uh, kind of plan. Unless you're, unless you've done this many a times and you're very seasoned in it. But I think a lot yeah. of investors might not be. But um, well, thank you so much for all that insight. That's great. Um, so when um, Alex, give us a little like, tell us how our listeners can learn more about you, uh, your business, Advanta, and uh, you know, move forward with getting an account open. Yeah, absolutely. Um, AdvantaIRA.com. So A D V A N T A I R A dot com. We're all over the website. Um, our <laughs> we tend to get more and more people every day that find us on the first page of Google, which is. A, it was a challenge, but we're there. Um, so if, if you want to learn more, uh, you can also reach me directly. Uh, it's my first initial last name. So a perny at advantaira.com or my direct line at 727-754-9954. Uh, give me a ring. I'd love to talk to you uh, and, and kind of get you through the questions and get you in a position where you can invest in not only uh, with whom you know, but in what you know as well, which is the catch marketing term that I do enjoy. And also, uh, you know, Charles, you were just on my podcast as well. So a little shameless plug for that. The Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Um, you can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, and our we're running up on our 69th episode next week. So, uh, you know, we're turning the corner into getting closer to 100 day, week by week. So really proud of that. Um, yeah. So that that's basically what I got for you. Charles, really appreciate you having me on uh, today on your podcast. Yeah, no, great, Alex. Thank you so much. And one, one thing I just want to kind of put in there with anybody that's a when working with any of these self-directed accounts is, uh, you know, Alex, any other self-directed uh, custodian is not going to be doing any due diligence for you. Okay. They're going to verify probably that the deal smells somewhat right, but they're not going to be the same thing with like the foundation issue. So you have to be well-versed in what you're doing and you have to perform your due diligence um, on properties, on the assets, on the people running it, whatever it might be, um, because they're not going to be doing that. So it's just one of the things is you have to know that going into it. Yeah, and that's that's a great point to leave to, to leave on. Um, you know, unlike stock markets that have, you know, things like the SEC and, and FINRA and stuff that are, you know, hopefully policing companies to make sure what they're doing. <laughs> um, you know, it, the the onus is on you. If you want to go in and buy a piece of real estate, we'll make sure deeds are correctly titled, we'll make sure documents are correctly done. But you need to be comfortable with who you're investing in. And to go back to my point of you know, investing for cash flow or having someone walk you through that new deal if you haven't done something before talk to people, get educated. Yeah. Um, it's a big part about what we do at Advantage, trying to educate people and, uh, you know, make sure people understand, you know, what they're investing in and whom they're investing with. Oh, great way. Great way to uh, leave it off, Alex. Thank you so much for coming on and looking forward to connecting with you here in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi guys, it's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.